It's all in the blood. The blood is thick and sweet, and once Serrat tastes it, he wants it more than anything else. This is the time to let the rat free. He will go hunting other rats. He knows where they live, where they go to eat. He knows all their habits. He prefers rats to eating garbage. Clifford Olsen, known as the Beast of BC and also as Skinner, which refers to his sexual preference of children, was a Canadian serial killer that had 11 known victims between the ages of 9 to 17 years of age that he murdered, and countless others as young as infants in which he molested. His true count will never be known as he died of cancer in prison in 2011. Come join me, Holly, in the murder she shed. Yes, I'm back for this true crime story. The place we discuss the dead right from my she shed. No subscribe. Do subscribe. I don't care. But either way, make sure you come back and visit me right here in my crime lair. And I'm so glad to be back in my murder she shed. I love Colorado. We had a blast. But there's no place I love better than home and my pups. Well, I will begin by giving a warning that this case does involve children being assaulted and murdered. So if this is a trigger for you, just go check out one of my other videos on my channel, Murder She Shed. <laughs> Sorry. Clifford Olson was born January 1st, 1940. His father, Clifford Sr., was a soldier in the Canadian Army. Leona Olson, Clifford's mother, would not discipline the young boy. By the time Clifford's dad came home from war, Clifford was almost five years old and he was used to always getting his way at that point. So when his dad began to use the belt, Sorry, sound effects. He rebelled against his father's authority, and he became a master at manipulating adults. At the age of four, his uncle would play a game with him. And it's not a good game. And he played it with the cousin, too. It's just not a game I would suggest you play with your uncle. We'll leave it at that. Nope. The uncle told them to strip naked and lay face down on the bed. The uncle would then lay on top of them and grind a word is so disgusting. I'm sorry for using that. After, he would pay them each a nickel to not tell anyone about the game. Years later, Clifford would say this game never had a negative impact on him. Oh, really? Hmm, could have fooled me. Like you didn't grow up to be a pedo or anything, old Clifford. Clifford was a small child and often bullied in school, so he decided he wanted to learn how to fight. He joined a boxing club and became a pretty good boxer, at which point he became the bully. He played hooky a lot and had a horrible grades in school, preferring to spend his time stealing from everyone and manipulating his way out of trouble. Everybody hid their cash and valuables when little Cliffy was around. Perhaps you should hide your little girls too because when Cliffy was 10, he would force girls into the bushes where he would touch them. And grind on them like his uncle had done to him. God, I hate that word. It's kind of like when you use the word moist. They are both just, uh, just gag, gag words. I don't grind moist. And I said them both in this video. Most disgusting words on the planet to me. I don't know what it is about them, but it's gross words. One time when he was a young boy, he found an old abandoned oven put a small child on it, and lit it on fire. The child started screaming, and someone came and rescued the child before any harm was done. Thank the Lord Jesus for that little miracle. Ozen had his first prison experience at 17 years old after trying to break into a furniture store. Maybe he needed a new futon, I don't know. His second prison sentence two years later. He had his first homosexual experience after he found two inmates already peeing a 16-year-old boy. Instead of helping the boy, because you know our Clifford's very upstanding, he joined in. In the next 25 years, he spent all but four years in prison, racking up over 50 convictions and seven escapes from prison. The convictions were mostly from theft charges. By the time he met his wife, Joan, in 1980, he had already molested countless boys and girls claiming he was bisexual but preferred girls. Joan was a divorcee with grown children when they met, and she claimed she was lonely and fell hopelessly in love with Clifford. Well, if I was Joan, I would rather die lonely in hell than get with little Cliffy, but not Joan. She even stated she would do anything he asked. One time, even at her pose nude with children that were also nude, 
as he took pictures, and when Joan was otherwise occupied, he would then R-A-P-E the children. Clifford was so egotistical that he believed SEX was all about him and did not believe anyone had the right to keep it from him, nor should his partners have any pleasure from it. He enjoyed beating Joan and RAPing her when she refused to comply to his wishes. Not long after meeting Joan, Clifford would kill his first child, 12-year-old Christine Weller. Christine came from a broken home. Her father and mother would always fight after her father would have a few drinks. At the time of her disappearance, she and her father were living in her grandmother's house after her mother had ran out on her family. Christine had went over at a friend's house, and he had loaned her his bike to ride back to her house on the way. She met her dad walking to the bar, and so in order to ride the bike further, she went with her dad. After her dad went into the bar, she was riding around in the parking lot when creepy Clifford pulled up. He would say the same lines and use the same technique on every abduction after it worked with Christine because really creepy Clifford wasn't that bright and couldn't think of anything new or original. He first would ask the child where the unemployment office was because he was hiring window washers at $10 an hour at houses he just built and would give them a business card of his made-up construction company. Then he would say, hop in, let me take you to the home where you will be working. Afterwards, offering the boy or girl a beer, Clifford would continue to give them liquor and then offer them a couple of pills, which he stated to them that it would sober them up before he took them home. Really, they were some knockout pills that his doctor had prescribed him for insomnia because, you know, Clifford had trouble sleeping because he was thinking of his evil deeds all night, I guess. I don't know. After the booze and pills had knocked Christine out, he took her to a secluded area. He would undress Christine and then himself, first RAP and sodomize her as she lay barely conscious. After he was done, he tried to leave but realized his car was stuck in the mud and didn't want to be caught with the 12-year-old child because he knew they would send him back to prison. Genius. He realized that he needed to get rid of her before calling a tow truck. He took laces out of her shoes and began strangling her. He ended up breaking the shoelaces, but she was still breathing. He then turned on her stomach, and as she lay wheezing, she couldn't even breathe. He sodomized her again. He then went back to his car, where he got a knife, and stabbed her repeatedly. He then threw his knife into the river, walked back to a hotel, where he called a tow truck. This would be the beginning of an almost two-year killing spree. On the way from the hospital, after Joan had gave birth to Clifford's son, he abducted 13-year-old Colleen Dagnall to celebrate the birth. Colleen was walking home from a friend's house when he stopped and did his usual routine to get Colleen into the car. Knocked her out with pills and took her someplace secluded. After RAPing and sodomizing her, he took a hypodermic needle and attempted to inject air into her arteries in order to kill her. When that failed, he dragged her into the woods and hit her over the head with a hammer. The first time he had killed, it was because he felt he had to. This time it was from enjoyment because he had learned that he actually liked it. The third victim would be 16-year-old Darren Johnsrud, who had just arrived in B.C. to visit his mother and stepfather, and he had walked to the store to buy him some little cigarettes. Because back in that day, kids could buy them right out of a cigarette machine. Anybody could have bought cigarettes. I walked in at six years old and bought my dad cigarettes. Easy peasy. But unfortunately, he encountered Clifford. After arriving at a secluded location, he spread a blanket on the ground and dragged the semi-conscious boy onto the blanket, rolled him on his stomach, and sodomized him. Clifford then would drag Darren close to the riverbank, hit him over the head with a hammer. Darren was still alive when Clifford draped his body over a tree stump and assaulted him again. Afterwards, hitting him in the head with the hammer until he was no longer breathing. Clifford enjoyed unconscious victims that could not fight against him, and he did not have to please them that way. The act of sex was all about his relief, and the act of killing further excited him. Joan did not realize by the time her and Clifford got married, he had already killed three children, although she did have suspicion that he had molested children. What the heck? No, I would not be with my husband if I thought that 
yet she still married him and allowed their son to be with Clifford, even though by this time he had also molested several infants. Clifford's next victim was 16-year-old hitchhiker Sandra Wolfsteiner. Sandra was hitchhiking to meet her boyfriend for lunch. Clifford, as usual, offered her a job, drug her, and drove her to a secluded area. Unfortunately, by the time he got there, Sandra was still conscious, so he directed her to walk down a trail, and as she tried to protect herself from the blows, he beat her several times with his hammer. As she drew her last breath, Clifford continued to sodomize her. At this point, Clifford didn't care if his victims were alive or dead as long as they lay still. So disturbing. Only two days later, after killing Sandra, he would kill his next victim. 13-year-old Ada Court had been walking home from babysitting her brother's children when she was abducted. After he had beat her with a hammer, R.A.P.'d her and sodomized her. He then buried her body with leaves and twigs. When he went to his car, he was stuck again. So while waiting for the tow truck, he returned to her body, dug her back up, and sodomized her again before leaving. So far, all of his victims, sadly, have been considered to be runaways because so many came from a troubled home. The authorities did not put much effort in locating them. Finally, they started looking into the missing children after a nine-year-old Catholic boy was murdered, Simon Partington. He was taken to the woods by Clifford, where he sodomized him. Afterwards, he took the boy's belt off his pants and put it around his neck, raised his foot against Simon's back, and pulled tight. After realizing he was still breathing, he plunged his knife through the little boy's chest. He then sodomized his body. Deep. Horrible. Awful. Four days later, 14-year-old Judy Cosmo was abducted after getting to a secluded site. Judy was still conscious and told Clifford she was scared. He replied by punching her several times in the stomach and head until she was then unconscious. After assaulting her, he then stabbed her 19 times with his knife. A few of the bodies had been recovered at this point, and Clifford had become a suspect of the murders, only after they learned he was bisexual, because the mix of victims being both male and female had confused authorities. His last known murders were the most cruel and gruesome of all of his victims. 15-year-old Raymond King was given the same offer of a job then drug onto a blanket, rolled onto his stomach, assaulted, and as Raymond woke up briefly, Clifford, who told Raymond to hold still, kid, put a nail at the crown of Raymond's head and drove it through the skull into his brain with a hammer while Clifford continued to sodomize him. Raymond, who was still breathing, made one attempt with his hand to reach backwards to push Clifford off, but he was too weak. Clifford drug him to a spot where He flung him into a gully. He finished Raymond off by throwing large boulders onto his body. How horrible is that? 18-year-old German student Sigrun Arn was abducted, then RAP'd and sodomized, and then Clifford asked her if she believed in God. When she softly said yes, then Clifford asked her to ask God to forgive him of all the RAPs and murders of all the children he had killed and for killing her. You really ask her that. If it was my one last words, I'd say, no, Clifford, you go to hell. But not her. She was nicer than me. Which, of course, she is halfway unconscious, but she said yes. So he then hit her three times with a hammer on the head, drug her to a ditch where he stuck her in nasty water and stood on top of her until no more bubbles came up to the surface. Clifford's last victim before he was caught was 15-year-old Terry Lynn Carson, who was a big animal lover. She loved puppies like me. She was on the way to a pet shop to be interviewed, and she was super excited about working with animals. Clifford offered her a job, and since she would make quite a bit more and her family needed the money, she agreed. After she was knocked out, he assaulted her in a secluded area, then grabbed a hammer and screwdriver from his car. He then walked back to her unconscious body and put the screwdriver on the crown of her head, and you know... With one quick hammer, the screwdriver slid all the way to the hilt into her brain. Terry still hadn't moved and Clifford felt a thrill of excitement. He tried to pull the screwdriver back out by wiggling it back and forth, but only managed to break the handle off. So he just left the blade embedded into Terry's skull. 
Clifford became excited and decided to assault her again. He thought she was dead, but she began to move again. He then pulled her over to some water where he stuck her face down and stood on her neck till she drowned. Three days later, after the murder of Terry, Louis Chartrand, 17, was assaulted and beaten with a hammer. He hit her head so hard with the hammer he had to pry it out of her head. Finally, Clifford Olson would be caught when attempting to pick up two hitchhikers and after hours of police interrogation would make a deal with Canadian authorities. Clifford told them he would help them find 11 bodies if authorities would give his wife Joan 10000 for each body. The 11th body would be a freebie. How kind of him. And guess what? Canadian authorities agreed to this deal. Clifford was given 11 concurrent life sentences and in 1992 would be denied the right to have a SEX doll in his cell and threatened to take the appeal all the way to the Supreme Court because it was his right to have a SEX doll for his men on physical health. Personally, I think they should have cut off his and shoved it where the sun doesn't shine. Definitely going to have to edit that one. Clifford was an egotistical, selfish perv all the way to the end of his life on September 2011. He ended up spending 50 years of his 71 years of life in prison. Joan would not divorce Clifford until 1985, saying she still loved him. She'd also keep the blood money she received from Clifford telling the locations of the bodies of where the children were to the family. Later, Joan would say the money had been eaten up in court costs and families of the victims suing her for the money. Well, Joan, I am for one happy about that. Clifford could have taken many more lives, but we may never know the actual amount of children this evil serial killer, necrophile, and pedophile tortured and murdered. Clifford is the most evil of evil anywhere. Anyone who can destroy innocent lives deserves to be in that hot place. That hot place way down there. Definitely. Well, guys, I am glad to say I am home and can let my little Simon say bye to you guys again. My oldest son is getting married this week, so I may only have time to bring you this one video until next week when life will get back to normal. By the way, if you have Netflix, you should go check out the new Jeffrey Dahmer series called Dahmer. Although I have heard the story a million times, this series has some great actors and is terrifying as well. Also lets you know the victims better. Episode 6 called Silence really got to me. I mean, I was basically crying for it's done. It was awful. Also, one more thing. In October, and maybe more than once in October, I'm not sure, depending on how it goes and how hard it is to set up. I have a campfire ring right out my she shed for Halloween in the wonderful month of Halloween. I'm going to tell a story to you right in front of that campfire. We'll see how that goes. Who knows? You know, me. Probably drop my camera in the fire. It's not that gifted, but I'll try. I will basically try anything once. After that, I don't know. Love y'all and hope everyone is having a blessed week. And now I'll leave y'all with a few bloopers of me and Simon. Bye. Have a great week. Bye. (laughs) For this try at two crimes. He rebelled against his father's before, before before he. This uncle would play a game. This uncle. It's not this uncle. His uncle. I'm not sure if he needed a new food futon. Yeah, I'm goofy sometimes. I won't lie. The murder, she said. <laughs> that sounds scary enough. All these YouTube people that have the deep voice, I envy so much. Is it so much more scarier than mine? Maybe you can read my lips. Read my lips. And when, Joan? Shit. Disgusting little horrible man. Ugh. Lipstick for your It's the only thing I see that rhymed. I or not say I need some lipstick for It wouldn't be nice, would it? Okay, let's move on from that. Now yeah, I better bleep that part out. I was just like, stick. No, oh, maybe pick, lick. That's even worse. That might be even worse. Yeah, let's not put those words together. Okay, let's keep going. Egotistical son of a mother trucker. I don't know. You are pulling my shirt off and everything else, but you good old boy. You good old boy. You good old boy. Yeah, I know you are, but I, I can't do that right now. Guys, I'm a farm girl and I'm not used to the big cities. When I was driving home and I was driving through Albuquerque, Albuquerque, you wild. I'll take a bear, a cougar, 
anything over our will of big city. I'm sorry city people. You guys know how to live in that kind of life and I know how to live in this kind of life. The woods and the animals. Maybe you are more scared of the woods and the animals but not me. I'm telling you Albuquerque was wild. Sorry if you're from Albuquerque but y'all just freaked me out up in there. Sorry. Just not a city girl. Never will be a city girl. Country born and bred. That's what I am. Bye, everybody. We love you at the Murder She Shed. Thank you for subscribing. We love when you subscribe. And we love that you love us, too. <laughs> and we love y'all, too. You little eyes. You and pretty love. You put the booty one. glad I can edit out because he just pulled my shirt. So I have to edit that, that, that part out. My own shirt went down. Okay. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Okay. Don't put my shirt off again. I love you, too. Bye, better go.